who was a Nobel Prize winner, Dr. Otto Warburg, MD. He was not a doctor in the traditional sense that most people think of a doctor. He was a medical doctor, but he was a researcher. Tonight I will be reading directly from this book, Otto Warburg, by Hans Krebs. I'll start with a letter that was written to him by none other than the renowned savant Albert Einstein from page 8 of Otto Warburg. Dear colleague, you will be surprised to receive a letter from me because up to now we've walked around each other without actually getting to know each other. I even fear that by this letter I might arouse something like displeasure, but I must write. I gather that you are one of the most able and most promising younger physiologists in Germany and that the representation of your special subject here is rather mediocre. I also gather that you are in active service in a very dangerous position so that your life continuously hangs on a thread. Now for a moment please slip out of your skin and into that of another clear-eyed being and ask yourself, is this not madness? Can you place yourself out there not to be taken by an average man? It's not important to prevent the loss of valuable man in that bloody struggle. You know this well and I must agree. Yesterday I spoke to Professor Krauss who entirely shares my opinion, willing to make arrangements that you be claimed for other work. I therefore entreat you as a consequence of what I have said. You may assist us in our endeavors to safeguard your life. I beg you to send me, after a few hours of serious heartfelt searching, a few lines so that we may know here that our efforts will not fail on account of your attitude. In the anxious hope of this matter, as an exception reason will once prevail, I am with cordial greetings. Yours sincerely, Albert Einstein. This letter illustrates the very high esteem in which Otto Warburg was held as a young scientist. He was, after all, not yet 31 when the war had started. They referred to World War I. It indicates that he must have had a reputation for being very strong-willed, not easily diverted from his views. In fact, Warburg came to write in his private papers that he had no higher service time of his life than the four years he spent in the military. Tonight, I will read to you from Hans Krebs a man who knew him from 1926 till his death, a man who knew him over 50 years, and this is his account. I will begin. The only interruption in my research during the past 53 years was the four years in World War I. I don't regret this interruption. In one of the finest uniforms of the old Prussian army, I rode many patrols in advance of the front line during the early advances into Russia. Later, when the war of the movement had ended, I was orderly officer to several of our great army commanders. In, this course of, in the course of this, I got to know the realities of life, which had escaped me in the laboratory. I learned to handle people. I learned to obey and to command. I was taught that one must be more than one appears to be. That was him talking about his time in World War I from page 10. Now the reason I want to talk to you and give you an insight into Otto Warburg is he holds the key to many of the things that I have built my uh, practice and the basis on which I ask you to try naturopathy. This man was the only two-time winner of the Nobel Prize. He won it in 1931. He thought he should have won it several other times. And in 44, Adolf Hitler would not allow him to accept it because he was a German Jew. Warburg's starting point in studying cancer, it will be recalled, was the question whether respiration rises, as it does in the sea urchin egg, when growth begins. What emerged was there was no rise in respiration, but there was a different source of energy significant amount of energy in neoplastic tissue being derived from glycolysis even under aerobic conditions. In aside tumor cells this can be a 50% but the total energy supply in terms of ATP production 
is no greater in cancer cells than in their non-growing parent cells. Why then is the rate of energy unchanged when the normal cells become cancerous and begin to grow? Whilst is there a great difference between the rates in the non-growing and the growing of sea urchin eggs? From page 25, these passages on the primary cause of cancer, written at the age of 83, still show Warburg's clear and logical, forceful style, but the balance of judgment in his view of most experts is at fault. The sweeping generalizations spring from gross simplification. This partial replacement of respiration by glycolysis is only one of the many characteristics which distinguish cancer cells from normal cells. Warburg neglected the fundamental biochemical aspect of the cancer problem that the mechanisms which are responsible for controlled growth of normal cells and which are lost or disturbed in the cancer cell. I close from page 24. In 1967, he summarized his views, meaning Otto Warburg summarized his views in a privately printed paper the prime cause and prevention of cancer. This appeared at page 477 and 494, including the following passages. There are primary and secondary causes of disease. For example, the primary cause of plague is the plague bacillus. But the secondary cause of plagues are filth, rats, the fleas that transfer the plague bacillus from rats to man. By the prime cause of disease, I mean the one that is found in every case of the disease. Cancer, above all other diseases, has countless secondary causes. Almost anything can cause cancer. But even for cancer, there is only one primary cause. Summarized in a few words, the prime cause of cancer is the replacement of the respiration of oxygen in normal body cells by a fermentation of sugar. All normal body cells meet their energy needs by respiration of oxygen, whereas cancer cells meet their energy needs in greater part by fermentation. All normal body cells are thus obligate aerobes, whereas all cancer cells are partial anaerobes. From the standpoint of the physics and chemistry of life, this difference between normal and cancer cells is so great that one can scarcely picture a greater difference. Oxygen gas, the donor of energy in plants and animals, is dethroned in the cancer cells and replaced by an energy-yielding reaction of the lowest living forms, namely a fermentation of glucose. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. I promised you that you would want to get a copy of this book. You'll want to research. You will question the traditions that you know. You will question them with boldness. Two-time prize-winning Nobel Prize-winning man. A doctor, 50 years a researcher, a friend of Albert Einstein. And he said categorically the prime cause of cancer was the fermentation of sugars. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. I hope that you understand that this should cause you to question with boldness the traditions that you know. This book is available. It's still in print. It's still not it's not in print, but it is available in antique bookshops. Amazon currently has a book as of last night for $216. Why is the book in so demand? I think that people are waking up. I think that people realize that there is no necessarily reason that we can't win this war on cancer. And I'm hopeful that the medical establishment and the researchers will again open Dr. Warburg's work and begin to work diligently to find a cure. I think that it causes you to pause. I think that I have given you a reason to say, what is naturopathy? I think more importantly, I have given you a reason to try naturopathy. Visit our website, try a free nutritional analysis. It's $135. That's what I charge my clients who see me here in Morrisville. What do you have to lose? Maybe the chronic disease that you have? Who knows? I wish you health, peace, and love.